Despite what you might have heard before, no two Disney parks are the same. So what rides, attractions, restaurants, lands, and even secrets will you only find in Disneyland and Disneyland alone? Let's discuss the most unique experiences in the West Coast parks today here on DFP Guide. I'm so excited. I love Disneyland. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. Now when you're trying to decide which Disney parks you want to travel to, it is best to know what different offerings each one can provide. While some park offerings might overlap with others, some remain completely unique to their specific location. So today we're going to talk about 20 things that you'll only be able to experience in Disneyland. So you can find out if the West Coast parks are the right fit for you. Before we get started, we got a free digital guide waiting to send your way that'll help you pull off three perfect days in Disneyland. So be sure to scan the QR code you see on your screen right now or head to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disneyland plans to download this guide from your computer instead. Okay, we're gonna dive in with one of the biggest and most unique things you're gonna find in the Disneyland Resort. Cars Land. Welcome to Radiator Springs. This is a place where cars are civilians and traffic cones are fast food joints and high speed races are part of everyday life. Cars Land is housed inside Disney California Adventure and has been a major part of this park since 2009. Now inside you're going to find multiple attractions and quick service restaurants and kiosks, cars themed gift shops, and maybe even one of your favorite cars characters out and about roaming the streets. I love when Red is out there. He is so cute. And while Mater's Junkyard Jamboree and Luigi's Rollickin' Roadsters are two flat rides that'll get you dancing and spinning. The most noteworthy ride in this section of the park is, of course, Radiator Springs Racers, which is going to take you on a scenic drive through Radiator Springs in your own little sentient convertible, followed by a thrilling race side by side with another car that I always seem to lose. So if you ever want to win this race, don't ride with me. Now, the ride does get extremely popular, so the lines for it can get real, real long during the day. And the biggest problem is that line is all outside and most of it is in the sun. So you can purchase an individual lightning lane to bypass that line, which tends to range around seven to $18 per person per ride through. That's part of the Genie Plus system. Now, it might also be worth checking to see if the free single rider line is open the day of your visit, which can help cut down on your weights too, but is going to break up your group. So you got to decide if that's really going to be worth skipping the majority of the wait for. While you aren't going to find any fine dining in Radiator Springs, which wouldn't make a whole lot of sense anyways, I guess, you can eat a quick service meal over at Flo's V8 Cafe, which offers up diner classics like cheeseburgers and chicken tenders and various sandwiches. And if you're more in a snacking mood, check out the Cozy Cone lineup. Each of these five cones serves different types of cone coctions like pop cone and chili cone queso and ice cream cones. Depending on what time of year you visit, Cars Land could have a whole different vibe going on since this side of the park receives massive overlays for both Halloween and Christmas. But no matter when you do visit, don't forget to check out Cars Land's lighting moment at dusk. Each evening when the sun sets, the neon lights of this small town flicker to life, starting from the courthouse and moving up Route 16. To watch this full progression, try standing towards the entrance of the land near Sarge's Surplus Gift Shop or by Mater's Junkyard Jamboree. And be sure to ooh and ah a lot when it happens too. It is very cool. By the way, one of my favorite little secrets in Cars Land is the traffic light. There's a scene in Cars where Sarge and Fillmore are watching the traffic light blink and they're talking about how every third light is a little bit longer. And it's actually true. That's what happens in Cars Land. It's something nobody would ever notice. One of those little imagineering details, but it's so fun that they included it. Okay, next up, I like churros and I like toffee, but when you put them together, a true masterpiece is in effect, which is why I'll probably never get over the churro toffee in the confectionaries around Disneyland, including Candy Palace in Disneyland Park, Trolley Treats in DCA, and Marceline Confectionery in Downtown Disney. That's right, you don't even have to go into a park to get this. Churro toffee is a handcrafted thick slab of crispy, buttery toffee dipped in white chocolate and coated in cinnamon sugar. Seems very basic, but it is more than the sum of its parts. I feel like I've been saying that a lot in these videos, but it's true. And while it's not going to be the prettiest dessert you're going to pick up in the parks, it doesn't need to be. It is that good. Churro toffee costs a little over seven bucks. You can also mobile order from these confectionaries too. So if the lines for any of these sweet shops are looking a little too intense, just order your churro toffee via the app and pick it up when it's ready for you. I always order like eight churro toffees from Marceline Confectionery when I'm leaving the park and then I pick them up on my way through downtown Disney and I fly them home and I eat, eat them over the next 
I'll say month, because they do keep really, really well, but I probably eat them faster than that. Another thing that's amazing about Disneyland is that you're gonna find places where Walt Disney himself has actually walked. This is probably Disneyland's biggest flex of them all. Walt Disney walked through Disneyland's streets and Fantasyland, Tomorrowland, New Orleans Square, Frontierland, Adventureland. He's been in them all aside from the newcomers like Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, but he never got the chance to do the same in most of his other parks. That means a lot of the classic buildings that you'll visit in Disneyland are rich with Walt Disney history. The Golden Horseshoe, for instance, may seem like just a quick service location now, but it also has the distinction of being where Walt Disney and his wife Lillian celebrated their 30th anniversary with a private party just days before the park itself opened. Cafe Orleans is known for having some top-notch Southern-inspired eats today, but way back when, Walt Disney himself spent a good chunk of time here, back when Cafe Orleans was called the Creole Cafe. It was one of his go-to spots for a good cup of coffee. And let's not forget, Walt even has an apartment on Main Street USA, right above the Disneyland Fire Station in Town Square. You can actually get an exclusive tour through Walt's apartment during the Walt's Main Street Story Tour, which is a 90-minute behind-the-scenes experience full of facts and stories and trivia challenges, all based around Walt Disney's childhood and personal history with the Disneyland Park. So this tour costs $160 per person on top of your regular day theme park admission, and you can book it online or through the Disneyland app. As much as Disney World probably wishes it could have some sort of Avengers campus somewhere, it ain't gonna happen anytime soon. And that's because of Marvel Superhero Island at Universal's Islands of Adventure. Due to contracts and agreements regarding the licensing of certain Marvel characters, which appear in the Universal Park, the Walt Disney Company can't use these particular characters east of the Mississippi River. Fortunately, this doesn't include all Marvel characters, which is why Epcot was able to open Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind in 2022, but over on the West Coast, DCA makes up for that lost MCU presence in the East Coast with a whole land dedicated to your favorite superheroes. Now, before I go on, I'm gonna admit this point is cheating a little bit since you can find an Avengers campus in overseas parks located in Disneyland Paris and Hong Kong Disneyland, but as far as parks in the United States are concerned, this campus is only a DCA thing. So let's take a look at what you're gonna find here. At the moment, Avengers Campus only has one ride called Web Slingers, a Spider-Man adventure, which is one of those blaster interactive sort of rides, except instead of using a Rudy Tooty point and shooty, you're gonna use your hands to shoot webs just like Spider-Man. And believe me, this is an exhausting ride. <laughs> <laughs> now, you can even upgrade your web slinging game with real web tech accessories found in the web supplier's gift shop that'll unlock power-ups and special abilities during your next ride. Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout is also technically part of the whole Avengers Campus area, even though it took over Tower of Terror years before Avengers Campus was ever an actual thing. Still, it's a thrilling Marvel-themed drop ride where you're going to get to help Rocket Raccoon save the rest of the Guardians while rocking out to one of six randomized song possibilities. I hope you get the Jackson 5. And if you visit during the Halloween season, you'll get to experience the Monsters After Dark version of this ride, which amps up the scare factor to 11 for those looking for some very intense thrills. It is spooky. Now, along with web slingers, you're going to find a lot of heroes out and about, whether it be Spider-Man slinging himself from the rooftops, Doctor Strange practicing his mystic arts, the Dora Milaje training guests to be Wakanda warriors, or several of the Marvel heroes coming together to face off against some of their greatest villains over at the Quinjet. You can learn all about the different showtimes via the Disneyland app. And when you start to feel peckish after all that training, there are a few quick services you got to choose from here, including Pim Test Kitchen, which offers food that's been shrunk or enlarged by Pim Particles, Pim Tasting Lab, which serves up small bites, craft beers, and cocktails, Shawarma Palace, a food cart with really good shawarma, and Terran Treats, another snack cart with sweeter options like specialty churros and other intergalactic desserts. One of my favorite things to get at Pim Test Kitchen, by the way, is that giant candy bar. It is so good and so worth the price. Now, Avengers Campus is planning a major expansion into the future, which will take things into the MCU multiverse, as well as bring us an all new ride where guests will be able to battle alongside the Avengers in an ultimate showdown against King Thanos. From what we heard about this new ride during the Destination D23 convention that took place earlier this September, the ride mechanics are sounding very familiar. According to Brent Strong, executive creative director from Disney Imagineering, the story behind this up and coming ride is that the Avengers have developed a new technology that allows Avengers Campus to become sort of a hub for the multiverse. This includes a new vehicle that can transport recruits to new worlds in a split second to go on a multi-world mission. 
And when concept art for this new ride vehicle was revealed, which Strong stated will combine elements of Tony Stark's time suits with Xandarian jump points and Wakandan technology, we started putting some pieces together. Split second takeoff, Xandarian jump points, sounds a whole lot like Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind over in Epcot if you ask me. Uh, we'll see. There's no news yet on when we're going to see this ride appear in the park, but we'll keep you updated on when we hear more. Now, every Disney park has its secrets, but only Disneyland has a teeny tiny man who lives in one of their trees. I feel like a bit of a backstory is necessary for understanding this one. The little man of Disneyland is named Patrick Bagora, and he made his first appearance in one of the Disney Little Golden Books, which according to Disney was published in 1955, the same year Disneyland opened. I actually have this little golden book. And Disney basically published it in order to kind of market Disneyland as being totally okay that they cut down all the trees and basically poured a bunch of concrete in this area of California. It's a very compelling marketing tactic. Now, who is Patrick? Well, he's a leprechaun who these days spends his hours in a teeny tiny house at the base of a tree in Adventureland right outside the Indiana Jones rides. So don't forget to track down his itty bitty home during your next visit. Tangled in all the roots at the bottom of that tree, you're gonna find a teeny tiny door and a teeny tiny window and a teeny tiny smokestack and a teeny tiny porch light. And he also decorates for St. Patrick's Day, of course. So Disneyland's newest quick service restaurant is the Bee's Knees, y'all. Tiana's Palace is themed around Disney's animated story, The Princess and the Frog, and right now it is the only park in the world that has Tiana's Palace restaurant. It features all kinds of eats, drinks, and decor inspired directly by the film. But just because this is a quick service doesn't mean you're not gonna find over the top theming here. The restaurant's atmosphere plucks you out of your day in Disneyland and transports you to New Orleans. Along with the New Orleans stylings going on inside Tiana's Palace, live music is often offered throughout the day along with plenty of Creole-inspired eats like gumbo, mufalata sandwiches, po' boys, shrimp and grits, and those sweet beignets. And don't worry, you can still grab a mint julep and the Mickey beignets from the attached mint julep bar here too, just like the good old days, but the beignets you're gonna get inside Tiana's Palace are going to be lemon-stuffed beignets. So good. Now, while this restaurant is one of a kind of Disneyland right now, there are a lot of rumors swarming about that we might see something similar pop up in Magic Kingdom on the East Coast, especially as we get closer and closer to the grand opening of Tiana's Bayou Adventure. Of course, these are just rumors rumors for now, but stay tuned and we'll let you know if and when they become a reality, because the more places I can buy beignets, the better. Now, behind Sleeping Beauty Castle rests a gift shop called Merlin's Marvelous Miscellany. Try saying that three times fast. While this shop is filled with classic Disney merch like mugs and shirts and character plushies, it's also lined with decorations that give plenty of nods to Disney's animated film, The Sword and the Stone. But back in the old days, this shop was actually called Merlin's Magic Shop, which was a lot easier to say three times fast. Merlin's Magic Shop opened when the park did back in 1955. And from 1955 to 1955, comedian Steve Martin actually worked as a salesperson and magician here. In past interviews, Martin stated that he knew every nook and cranny of the shop during his time there, and fun fact, Disneyland is where Martin started to develop some of his iconic comedy acts. He even created his famous excuse me line based off of one of the performers he knew in Disneyland. So have any other celebrities worked in Disneyland before they made it big? Tons. Both Robin Williams and Kevin Costner were once Disneyland Jungle Cruise skippers. Michelle Pfeiffer used to perform in the former Main Street Electrical Parade, and Richard Carpenter used to play the piano on Main Street USA. Now, while Merlin's Marvelous Miscellany is no longer the magic shop it used to be, there is still a magic shop over on Main Street USA, appropriately named Main Street Magic Shop, which has been around since 1957. As you're making your way into the park, you'll find the magic shop right across the street from the Emporium, so don't forget to pay it a visit. Now let's talk about the El Capitoon Theater. Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway might already exist in Disney's Hollywood Studios over on the East Coast, but Disneyland has taken this new dark ride to a whole new level. At the beginning of this year, Disneyland Park completely revamped their Toontown, which brought with it new interactive elements, an updated quick service, more open space, and the biggest addition of all, Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. So how is Disneyland's version of Runaway Railway different from Disney World's version? Well, when it comes to the main ride, 
nothing. They're pretty much identical to one another with a few little changes in Easter eggs here and there. But the queue, on the other hand, is where the stark differences are. While Hollywood Studios' version of Runaway Railway is housed inside that replica of the Grauman's Chinese Theater, Disneyland's version happens at the El Capitoon Theater, where you'll be able to explore a special exhibit created by the Toontown Hysterical Society, showcasing life in the Toon world before you take off on your Runaway Railway adventure. Along with all the different immersive elements going on in this queue, be on the lookout for items and Easter eggs from animation classics, such as Steamboat Willie, Plane Crazy, and Mickey's Christmas Carol. Next up, let's talk about a brand new addition, even newer than the El Capi tune, an entire land dedicated to a personal healthcare companion. On August 31st of this year, we said goodbye to the Pacific Wharf and hello to San Francisco Square over in Disney California Adventure. San Francisco Square is inspired by the animated city featured in Big Hero 6, which is essentially a fictional mashup of San Francisco and Tokyo. In this new area, you can eat at refreshed dining experiences, shop around a new gift store, and meet everyone's favorite inflatable personal healthcare companion, Baymax. Ba -la 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 -la. Don't worry, the dining locations that were once part of the former Pacific Wharf area didn't go anywhere. So go ahead, let out that sigh of relief you've been holding. You can still get mac and cheese in a giant bread bowl. Now, while some of these eateries remain relatively unchanged, others have been rethemed for the San Francisco area, like how the Pacific Wharf Cafe transformed into Aunt Cass Cafe, and Rita's Baja Blenders transformed into Rita's Turbine Blenders. Across all of these eateries, the fan favorite Pacific Wharf eats, like the soups and bread bowls and beef beer ramen, are sticking around, but they're also joined by several new items, including options like Japanese style fluffy cheesecake from Aunt Cass Cafe, Baymax macarons at the Lucky Fortune Cookery, San Francisco street corn at Cocina Cucamonga, and so much more. So who knows, maybe you'll find your new favorite Disney snack in San Francisco during your next visit. Now, how about hidden passages and steam rooms right in your hotel room? Usually, I'm just satisfied with a nice bed and multiple bathroom options for my hotel room, but the Disneyland Hotel has made me start rethinking my resort needs. Disneyland has three different hotels on property you can book if you want to stay within the Disney bubble, and these include the Grand Californian Hotel and Spa, Paradise Pier Hotel, which is currently being reimagined into Pixar Place Hotel, and the classic Disneyland Hotel. While you're more than welcome to get a standard room at any one of these locations, the Disneyland Hotel has some straight up super bougie suite options with over-the-top theming that might make it hard to leave your room to actually experience the parks. The Disneyland Hotel has five theme signature suites that truly embrace the immersive experience that Disney is known for. The five suites are the Adventureland Suite, the Big Thunder Suite, the Fairy Tale Suite, the Pirates of the Caribbean Suite, and the Mickey Mouse Penthouse Suite. Like I said, these aren't your everyday hotel rooms. These are advanced hotel rooms, complete with immersive magical Disney touches. For example, if you turn the knob marked Do Not Turn in the Big Thunder Suite, which of course you will, it triggers sound effects of the attraction's runaway mine train. And if you're staying in the fairy tale suite, Tinkerbell flies in and lights the room with pixie dust when the door closes behind you. And let's not forget those hidden passages and steam rooms I mentioned at the start of all this. The Adventureland suites are full of hidden surprises like bookcases turned into closets and paintings hiding away TVs. But one of my favorite parts about this suite is the master bathroom, which has been made to look like a grotto in the shower and uses lighting and sound effects to simulate both a rainforest and a savanna. Yeah, can I move here forever? please. On top of all these Disney touches, guests staying in these suites also have access to a list of amenities that includes continental breakfast, personal assistance from the club staff, nighttime cookies and desserts, afternoon snacks, exclusive access to the e-ticket club in the Adventure Tower, and a wine and cheese reception in the evenings. So how much will these magical suites cost you? The short answer, a lot, but it really all depends on which suite you book when you book it, and how long you book it for, and the time of year. But in general, you can expect to pay from $2,000 to $4,500 plus per night for one of these bougie stays, but some of them have multiple bedrooms, so you might be able to share it with another friend or family. Now, what's one thing that Disney World and Disneyland have in common? They both like to start celebrating the holidays really, really early. But the one major thing they don't have in common? The Nightmare Before Christmas Haunted Mansion overlay, which is why Disneyland automatically wins the holiday season, in our opinion. Kind of joking, but not really. Now, between early September and throughout the beginning of January, Disneyland's version of Haunted Mansion gets a Tim Burton-esque makeover, meaning you'll get to see Jack Skellington and Sally and Oogie Boogie and Lock, Shock and Barrel, Zero, and several of their frightful friends as they take over the Haunted Mansion to spread a little Halloween and Christmas cheer in their unique way. 
The only downside of this overlay is that before and after it happens, the Haunted Mansion has to close for a while to either put everything up or take everything down. So you'll want to check on the Disneyland website to see when this refurb is scheduled to happen so you don't accidentally miss out on visiting the Happy Haunts. World of Color 1 while Disney California Adventure isn't the only park to have water projection features in a nighttime spectacular, it is the only park to do this with a Pixar Pier backdrop in a show that's completely unique to the West Coast. World of Color takes place nightly at DCA and features mist screens, 1200 dancing fountains, lasers, fog, music, flame effects, and a massive water screen projecting your favorite Disney characters. Currently, the World of Color show has been replaced by a new version called World of Color 1. This is a performance in honor of the Disney Company's 100th year anniversary, and it's still a very similar water screen show featuring your favorite Disney, Star Wars, Marvel, and Pixar characters, but it takes that extra step to celebrate the art of storytelling throughout the performance. According to Disney, the show celebrates how one single action, like a drop of water, can create a ripple that grows into a wave of change. To view World of Color 1 from its best vantage point, you'll need to enter into a virtual queue via the Disneyland app. At noon, the queue will open for you to snag a boarding group number. If there are multiple showtimes that night, the first showtime will fill up first before they open the queue for the second one. If you're unable to secure a virtual queue spot, don't stress, that doesn't mean you're going to completely miss out. You can always check with a cast member at the Paradise Bay viewing area right before showtime to see what walk-up viewing options might still be available or just find yourself a spot somewhere along the DCA main promenade and you're going to be fine. Now let's talk about those classic rides that you can only find in Disneyland. While we love hitting up Disney World to experience its one-of-a-kind rides, like Flight of Passage in Animal Kingdom and Slinky Dog Dash in Hollywood Studios, and of course Spaceship Earth in Epcot, Disneyland is the park that set the bar for all the other Disney parks out there, which is why we have a whole other level of appreciation for these classic dark rides and coasters. Let's talk about the Matterhorn bobsleds. This has a very similar vibe to Expedition Everest in Animal Kingdom. They're both mountains. They're both high-speed coasters, they both have Yetis, but Matterhorn bobsleds came first and has some very distinct differences from Expedition Everest, including no backwards momentum, super jerky bobsled twists and turns, and an abominable snowman who never fails to jump scare me every time I ride. Now, of course, we have to talk about Mr. Toad. Magic Kingdom used to have Mr. Toad's Wild Ride before it was replaced by the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Now, Mr. Toad only remains in Disneyland Park, but his dark ride here isn't any less wild than it was in Disney World. During your adventure, you'll drive with reckless abandon through a cardboard cutout style town, crashing through bars and nearly flying off a pier before getting hit by a train and finally ending up in, well, a very bad place to keep spoilers out of this. So this is a very weird ride. It is incredible. And if you ever get to Disneyland, please make sure you ride this one. Also, there's Alice in Wonderland. So despite the fact that both Disney World and Disneyland have the Mad Tea Party, Disneyland also has a second Alice in Wonderland attraction right next to the Mad Tea Party. This dark ride uses lots of black light sets and animatronics and projections to tell a trippy, weird, nonsensical story that's won the hearts of many. I'm going to stop there for now, but there are so many unique Disneyland rides. I still could talk about storybook canal boats. Snow White, Pinocchio. So if you want to learn about all the rides across both Disneyland and DCA, make sure to check out our Disneyland ride ranking video after this. Time to talk festivals, y'all. Epcot seasonal festivals are great, but DCA seasonal festivals could sure teach Disney World a thing or two about how it should be done. Throughout the year, DCA hosts three different festivals, one for Lunar New Year, one for Food and Wine, and one for Festival of Holidays. With these festivals come tons of exclusive entertainment offerings and food booths, lots of food booths, but instead of having to go up to each individual food booth and wait in line and order and pay and repeat, DCA helps save you a whole lot of time and potentially money. First of all, DCA Fests have a sip and savor pass option that you can purchase. With this, you'll get a lanyard with eight entitlement tabs to redeem for select food and non-alcoholic beverages at participating locations, instead of having to individually pay for each item you wanna try. You just buy the sip and savor pass and hand over one of those entitlement tabs for each thing you wanna try. Now, secondly, this is genius, and I do not know why they don't have this in Epcot yet. You can pay for all the festivals items you want at one booth and not wait in line at any of the other booths. Now, here's how that works. First, choose one of the festival food booths with the shortest line. Next, make sure you know all the different items you want to try before you get up to the register to order and pay for them all. Once you order, you'll be given a receipt. Now, let me clarify, you can order items from any booth. 
any of them at this one booth. Now, instead of having to wait in the main food booth lines to keep ordering and paying for your food, you can take that receipt up to each booth's pickup location to grab the items you've already purchased. It is brilliant, it is genius. I do not know why we don't have this in Epcot. Did I say that before? I think I did. Ooh, this one's one of my favorites, Villain's Grove. DCA's Oogie Boogie Bash makes me wish Halloween were more than an annual thing because this after hours event is nothing short of a good time and it sells out so fast. Now, Oogie Boogie is a limited capacity separate ticket event that happens on certain nights between 6 and 11 p.m., though event ticket holders may enter DCA as early as 3 p.m. with no park reservations necessary. During the event, you'll be able to experience exclusive Halloween entertainment and activities like the Frightfully Fun Parade, Treat Trails, and the rarest character appearances from some of the most dastardly Disney villains out there. This year, we saw characters like Yokai from Big Hero 6, Judge Doom from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Agatha the Harkness was back from WandaVision, Oogie Boogie himself is always there, and lots of other Disney antagonists. Okay, they're not all antagonists. Some of them are just misunderstood. Isn't that right, Bruno? Now, while Magic Kingdom's After Hours Halloween party might have the upper hand when it comes to their castle shows and more expansive snack offerings, DCA makes up for that with these rare characters, as well as their Villain's Grove. Villain's Grove takes place inside the Redwood Creek Challenge Trail and transforms this area into an immersive walkthrough inspired by Disney villains. Now, if you're someone who's interested in haunted mazes, but you really can't get behind the jump scare, and gore, Villains Grove is a great alternative to that. The entire walkthrough is 100% family friendly, but still manages to use light and music in a way that keeps things eerie and absolutely incredible. You will love it. Make sure you make time for it if you go to Oogie Boogie. Now, it was very, very important to Walt Disney for Disneyland to have a train that circled around the perimeter of the park. Of course it was. Now, granted, because of Walt's love for trains, you're going to find trains in the Disney parks worldwide. But what makes Disneyland's version so special is that tunnel that runs between the Tomorrowland and Main Street USA stations. This tunnel is not your average train tunnel because it's adorned with two different dioramas. The first diorama depicts the Grand Canyon and features many model plants and animals against a painted backdrop up normal enough, but the second diorama transports you back into the primeval world. When you enter into this section of the tunnel, a dramatic score starts to play while audio animatronic brontosauruses munch on some plants or just vibe all dino-like. And in the thrilling prehistoric conclusion, an epic battle between Stegosaurus and T-Rex takes place, all while they're surrounded by a stream of molten lava. If that's not hardcore, I don't know what is. I also don't know how much of it is, you know, authentic, but there we go. Cinderella Castle and Magic Kingdom may have fancy dining inside, but the experience inside Sleeping Beauty Castle at Disneyland is absolutely free and doesn't require any advance reservations. You can just go do it whenever you want. The Sleeping Beauty Castle walkthrough tells the story of Princess Aurora in a series of colorful storybook pages and animated 3D window screens. Now, before you go check this out for yourself, I've got two things for you to keep in mind. One, when you're looking at those window screens, don't just briefly peek in and move on to the next one. Some of the special effects may not trigger right away, so give them some time to activate and show off what they can do. And two, the castle walkthrough does involve a lot of stair climbing and enclosed hallways that can feel kind of tight. So if you or someone in your group won't be able to experience this attraction, there is a virtual alternative experience available in a special room on the ground floor. Be sure to ask a cast member if you need help tracking it down. We are back to the Candy Palace because this place serves desserts that are so popular, you might even need to enter a virtual queue just for your chance to buy one. There are two handmade seasonal treats that cause quite the stir in Disneyland every year, and that's the chocolate eggs for the Easter season and the candy canes for Christmas. On select days throughout the week leading up until Easter, you can get your chocolate-covered fudge Easter egg fix. These fudge eggs are not only ginormous, but every year they also have a totally unique design and flavors. But my forever favorite will probably be the peanut butter fudge eggs. They have them once in a while, but you never know if they're going to be back. Meanwhile, around Christmas time, both the Candy Palace and Trolley Treats create the massive 18-inch hand-pulled candy canes on select days throughout the season. These peppermint goodies get so popular that Disneyland has been using a virtual queue system for the past two years so that you don't have to spend your entire day just waiting in line to buy a candy cane. Last year, you would scan a QR code, drop in your phone number, and the confectionery would text 
against you once it was your turn to get one. We're assuming something similar might happen this year for those candy cane goodies, but we'll let you know when we get closer to the time. Just join our newsletter. It's totally free and you can see the link to join in the description below. So every single one of Disneyland's 85 carousel horses in Fantasyland has a name, but the most special horse of them all is the one they call Jingles. Jingles is pretty easy to spot. She's the lead horse with all those shiny golden bells, hence the name, but she also just so happens to be Walt Disney's favorite horse of the bunch. In 2008, Jingles received a makeover to celebrate Julie Andrews, the practically perfect Mary Poppins herself, and her 44 years of service to the Disney company. Imagineers thought that dedicating the lead carousel carousel horse to the actress would be a fitting tribute since Mary Poppins had ridden a similar carousel horse in the film. And that's why, along with all the Jingle's golden bells, she also has Julie Andrews' initials and other Mary Poppins-themed features decorating her saddle. Okay, I'm taking us back to the streets of San Francisco one more time because this is my absolute favorite part about this area. Pacific Wharf was home to a working replica of San Francisco's Boudouin Bakery, and thank goodness this experience still remains as part of the reimagined San Francisco Square today. You can take a tour and see for yourself the process behind making the famous San Francisco sourdough bread and maybe even score a free sample along the way. And over at the bread cart, you can even get a big loaf of freshly baked bread that looks just like Baymax. Okay, friends, hit me with it. What's your favorite super unique part about Disneyland? Or if you've never been, what are you most looking forward to experiencing here? Let me know in the comments. And before you head out today, be sure to drop by DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disneyland plans to grab your free guide to help you plan the perfect three days in Disneyland for your future West Coast vacation. Thanks for listening, everyone. And thanks for watching. I love talking about Disneyland. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.